Ladies, gentlemen and MBs, just to let you know that this video will be discussing some movies from the 1930s and 40s, and some of the material within them is just super racist. Like, Disney Plus would slap one of those outdated cultural depiction disclaimer cards on them kind of racist, and I will be discussing it, so be ready. The Marx Brothers. Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and sometimes Zeppo. This family of comedian performers got their start on the vaudeville stage, and worked their way up to star in 13 films between the years of 1929 and 1949. They are some of the most influential comedians of all time, with two of their films being at the American Film Institute's list of the top 100 comedies of all time back in the year 2000. I first discovered them when I was a kid, and a friend of mine showed me one of their films. I fell in love with them immediately, and watched as many as I possibly could. They're wonderful stuff. Silly, nonsensical, and never missing an opportunity to crack some of the sharpest jokes that you're ever likely to see in any film. You love your brother, don't you? No, but I'm used to him. I could honestly watch just about all of them endlessly. The night I drank champagne from your slipper. Two quarts. It would have held more, but you were wearing inner soles. So yes, without a doubt, the Marx Brothers are some of my favourite comedians of all time in some of my favourite comedies of all time. But what if I were to tell you that they were also... Kind of based. The basic goal of this video is to look at the Marx Brothers filmography through a Marxist lens and see if there is more substance to these irreverent comedies than just the jokes. Which, judging by the just over 4,000 words that I've written on this, there is. So let's dive right in and do a Marxist reading of the Marx Brothers. And yes, this whole video is based on a pun. You're welcome! So, given that we are dealing with 13 whole movies here, it's going to make it easier if we split the Marx Brothers films into a couple of distinct periods. We have the early films, with the five ranging from 1929's The Coconuts to 1933's Duck Soup, and the MGM films, with six ranging from 1935's A Night at the Opera to 1946's A Night in Casablanca. There are also a couple of outliers, with 1938's Room Service and 1949's Love Happy, neither of which really fit in with the rest of their output, with Room Service not being written specifically for the brothers, and Love Happy being a Harpo solo vehicle that got hijacked by Chico and Groucho, and I won't be talking about them here. Now, the early films are notable because they tend to be fairly light on plot. They're more or less just excuses for the four brothers to wreak some havoc, but for this to work properly you need the correct setting, where their presence will cause the most distress and gain the most laughs. What they almost invariably went with was to put themselves around rich people. The films would largely take place in settings where you would find a lot of wealthy socialites that the brothers' characters stood in firm contrast to. They always played the same characters in every film. Sure, the names were different, but the costumes and mannerisms were always the same. They may be called Quincy Wagstaff, Baravelli and Pinky, but you know that Groucho will talk a mile a minute and deliver incredible insults. Is it true you're getting a divorce as soon as your husband recovers his eyesight? Chico will make atrocious puns. Didn't you ever see a habeas corpus? No, but I see habeas Irish Rose. <laughs> and Harpo will do his unique pantomime and pull all sorts of wonders from out of his coat. Young man, as you grow older, you'll find you can't burn the candle at both ends. Well, I was wrong. I know there was something you couldn't burn at both ends. I thought it was a candle. And for these first five films, Zeppo is... Hunga Dunga, Hunga Dunga, Hunga Dunga, and McCormick. Also there, they're reliable characters to a fault, and they are always somewhere that they do not really belong. Their characters are coded as very poor, their clothes are ill-fitting and threadbare, they are always looking for ways to get food or make money, and they act most improperly. So it forms an interesting clash with the surroundings that they are in. Their first two films, The Coconuts and Animal Crackers, were based on works they had performed on the stage as something of a parody of a comedy of manners. Think. Oscar Wilde, drawing rooms, wealthy dowager ants, that sort of thing. They simply took the kind of setting where these plays might take place, in The Coconuts, a Florida hotel, in Animal Crackers, a several day long mansion party, and dropped themselves into the middle of it as these bizarre characters, and then just sort of saw what mischief they could get into. The characters that you would expect to see in these locations are all carrying on doing the usual routine that would be familiar in these situations. There's disputes over land, stolen paintings, young lovers, and just generally a lot of very idle rich people. Then, thrown into the middle of that, are the brothers causing havoc. Groucho tends to be something of a bridge between the high society types that they are hanging around and the low-class Harpo and Chico. In the Coconuts, he's the manager of the hotel where Harpo and Chico come with plans to rob and swindle the wealthy patrons. Do you, do you know that suitcase is empty? That's all right, we fill it up before we leave. And in Animal Crackers, he's the guest of honour at the party while Harpo and Chico are the musicians. What do you fellas get an hour? Oh, for playing we get $10 an hour. I see. What do you get for not playing? $12 an hour. 
So Groucho can interact with the upper class characters with no problem because he's in a position of respect with them, whereas Harpo and Chico are less respectable and gain access to the scenes mainly because Groucho allows them. Once let into the scenes, Harpo and Chico's interactions with wealthy people are wild swindles, with Chico trying to get any kind of money he can out of them, with a prime example being him and Harpo rigging a bridge game in Animal Crackers. He's a hustler and a cheat, and he puts on an air of stupidity that the rich people are all too willing to accept to work his tricks. Meanwhile, Harpo just robs them blind and isn't even subtle about it. They're met with disgust and shock over their actions and treated as scoundrels, but Groucho is welcomed by them with open arms. His interactions with them are just as peculiar as Harpo and Chico's. He uses confusing fast talk to put people on the back foot, and he lets loose some of the most creative insults that you're ever likely to hear in any film. Yes, I don't think I've ever seen four more beautiful eyes in my life. Well, three anyway. But where the other brothers are treated cruelly over it, Groucho is fawned over. He is a guest of honour and a respected citizen, so everyone bends over backwards to be accommodating to him, even though he is easily just as bad as the others. Through these interactions with the wealthy people they are surrounded by, and the reception that their antics receive depending on which brother is the perpetrator, they reveal the truth behind the artifice. These rich people, who put on such airs and graces and think themselves so superior, are all simple, easily tricked rubes who care more about the established hierarchy of their social order than anything, simply cannot handle the brothers coming in and tearing their carefully maintained appearances to shreds. By just being themselves and showing no respect for these supposed codes of the hierarchy, they reveal the arbitrary nonsense that goes behind it. There isn't anything that makes these people better than the brothers. They aren't smarter than them, they aren't quicker than them, and they definitely aren't as funny as them. They just think they are because of their wealth, and the brothers being there serves as a rude awakening. Nowhere is this aspect of the movies more clear than in the one performer who most represents the upper class characters that the brothers were taking down a peg. Someone who is more important to the Marx Brothers movies than even Zeppo. And he was one of the Marx Brothers! I'm of course talking about the legendary Margaret Dumont. Margaret Dumont was a working character actress who appeared with the Marx Brothers in seven of their 13 films. Like the brothers, she also always played the same character but with different names. She is a wealthy dowager who is at the centre of the society that the brothers are showing up. She is staunched and unmoved by their antics, at the most confused, never outraged. She allows it to go on because, as a society woman, she cannot be seen to react in case she creates a scene which would clearly be an unforgivable faux pas. She was so supremely good at not reacting much to the stuff that was going on that it led to a rumour that she didn't understand the jokes, a rumour which Groucho was all too happy to spread. She was a great straight woman for me, even though she never understood any of my jokes. <laughs> she used to say, Judy, what are they laughing at? And this is a minor diversion, but I hate this rumour. The reason Margaret Dumont didn't laugh at the jokes is because she was an actress and that was her job. Yes, the Marx Brothers are funny, but not so much that an actor can't do their job around them. Did you think it was weird when any of the other performers didn't laugh at the jokes? Or is it just because it was a prominent woman within their films? Yes, I'm saying this is misogyny, and Margaret Dumont deserves to be remembered as more than just the woman who didn't get Groucho's jokes. But her barely responding to the jokes does help the way that the Marx Brothers reveal the artifice that we've discussed. Because any reasonable person would surely see these people coming around and doing... Whatever this is, and at the very least ask them to stop. But the wealthy people in these movies never respond to it. They never call anyone out, they just allow it to happen, because they can't be seen to break their appearance of civility, because you maintain your position by maintaining your appearance, even if that means letting Harper Marx steal all of your silverware. I can't understand what's delaying that coffee pot. Where's the cream? This simple juxtaposition of the brothers with more high-class environments would continue through the films that were written specifically as films. Monkey Business and Horse Feathers both work off the simple idea of putting the brothers into specific locations and letting the jokes form from that. In Monkey Business, they are stowaways on a cruise ship. I would have to report there are four stowaways in the forward hatch. Stowaways? How do you know there are four of them? Well, they were saying Sweet Adeline. And they just generally run around and mess with the rich passengers. In Horse Feathers, Groucho is appointed the Dean of a University and hires Harpo and Chico to be ringers in an American football game. So he's in a position of respect that he drags down into the gutter and brings Harpo and Chico into that world to make a mockery of it too. This idea of Groucho getting put into a position of power would be further explored in perhaps their most popular film, Duck Soup. 
In this film, the country of Friedonia needs money and turns to their wealthy resident, Margaret Dumont, who offers them the money they need on one condition. They have to appoint Groucho as their president. So immediately, we have Groucho put in charge of an entire country because a wealthy woman held it hostage out of nepotism. Once he's president, Groucho can only abuse the power given to him and disrupt the process at every turn. He takes Chico from working a peanut cart and appoints him Minister of War. You want to be a public nuisance? Sure, how much does the job pay? He causes havoc in council meetings, and he just consistently acts like there are no rules for him because, functionally, there aren't. They use the brothers' antics to state that government officials are easily corrupted liars and cheats who just do not care about the consequences of their actions. They're right, and they should say it. This leads to Groucho getting into an argument with the ambassador of the neighbouring country Sylvania over really trivial nonsense that throws the two countries into war. So, you refuse to shake hands with me, eh? See, say this is the last straw. There's no turning back now. This means war! So, because of the whims of the rich and powerful, it's the regular people of the countries who suffer in a war that could have been avoided if the system wasn't so broken. Yes, this Marx Brothers film goes hard on its political commentary, and I am here for it. These first five films work to establish the way that the Marx Brothers use their antics to reveal the artifices and abuses of wealth. Mostly this was done in service of very little story, but following this, they would move to MGM Studios, where the way that their films were structured would change. Under MGM and the oversight of the producer Irving Thalberg, the films started to have more plot. They'd started toying with this a little bit in Duck Soup, but still most of that film was just given up to random hijinks done without much thought to cohesion. But beginning with A Night at the Opera, they were much more tightly plotted, with the brothers' characters worked in more organically. There were still hijinks, of course, that's what you'd want out of these films after all, but they worked differently. They were done in service of the story. They were targeted antics. A Night at the Opera is the prime example. It has a fairly traditional three-act structure, with Groucho starting out having scammed his way into high society by conning a wealthy dowager, Margaret Dumont again, and convincing her to invest her money in the opera. So the whole film is built around one of the most recognised symbols of the upper class in the shape of the opera. It's there that Harpo and Chico come in. Harpo working for the villainous Tenor Laspari, and Chico being old friends with Ricardo, one of the film's young lovers, who is a singer in the opera, but doesn't have the fame to be moved across to New York with Laspari and Ricardo's love, Rose. Through a misunderstanding, Groucho ends up with Harpo, Chico and Ricardo stowing away in his stateroom, leading to one of their more iconic routines, with people piling into the room until they're stuffed in there like sardines, in a direct contrast to the wild opulence of Margaret Dumont's stateroom we've seen before this, showing clearly that the wealthy get unchecked privileges over the poor, and creating a truly legendary moment of comedy in the process. Following their time on the ship, we see another difference in the new films. Groucho loses his position because he's been associating with Harpo and Chico. In the early films, he never suffers any consequences for being so ridiculous and tearing social norms to shreds, but now he becomes a victim of the class he's been trying to work himself into. He has taken all this time to get in with these people, and then, because he spends time with the riffraff, he gets hurled bodily out of his position at the opera company. By the way, just look at this stunt! That is a lot of stairs! God damn! This puts the brothers into a low point, where they're completely cut off of the resources they need to get by. The day you boys came into my life, I had a good job and was about to marry a rich widow. Now I can't even sit on the grass. I'd give you my seat, but I'm sitting here. Homeless and broke, they seem almost totally defeated, until they decide to go and take revenge on the company. So they go to the opera, and they just pull out every stop to wreck it. Boogie, boogie. Until eventually they basically hold Laspari hostage to get Ricardo into the lead of the show. Ricardo has the talent to be the lead in the opera, but he was denied the opportunity because he didn't have the reputation yet. Because the rich people hadn't heard of him, they denied his talent. But when they're stuck with no choice, suddenly their arbitrary rules go out of the window. We've seen the exact opposite of this already in the movie. While they're on the boat, Harpo, Chico and Ricardo go looking for food, and are treated to the most spaghetti any human being has ever eaten by the passengers in steerage. Then Ricardo sings a song, and Harpo and Chico sit down to play some nearby instruments. For a brief moment, the band members try to stop them, but then the passengers ask them to let them play. So the poor passengers, who have already been shown to be compassionate with the food, are perfectly willing to let these total strangers play for them. 
Because they aren't just stuck up to accept these people that they haven't heard of, they don't miss out on these wonderful musical performances. And truly, these performances are simply amazing. As a kid, I never really appreciated these moments, but Chico's piano solos and Harpo's harp solos are such unique, quiet moments in these otherwise wild and raucous movies. Chico's piano skills are so fast and seem so effortless, And Harpo changes from energetic rampages to a still and calm virtuoso. They show that talent knows no class, and that by judging people on their status, you might be denying yourself wonderful and unique art. So perhaps the biggest difference for these movies is how they actively villainize some of the wealthier characters. One of the first things that we see Laspari do is whip Harpo. L like with an actual bull whip that he just has in his dressing room for some reason. This serves the double purpose of making him look terrible and making us feel okay when Harpo responds in kind. You're sorry for what you did, eh? That shows a nice spirit. Oh, he's coming along. Yeah, he'll be fine now. He continues to be a selfish snob. In contrast to Ricardo, Harpo and Chico giving away their music for free, he makes excuses for not singing and says, Why should I sing for them when I'm not being paid for it? Which is not to say that artists shouldn't get paid for their work, just don't be a dick about it. So by putting the brothers, who are still shown to be poor, working class characters, in contrast to them as the good guys of the movie, then it sends a very clear message. This kind of thing continues through the remainder of the movies in this period, to varying degrees. A day at the races at the circus and the big store all see Groucho conning his way into Margaret Dumont's affections to gain access to the upper class. In Go West and A Day at the Races you get the low points where they're completely broke that spurs them on to take on the villains, and in A Night in Casablanca they fight Nazis. That last one doesn't really fit in with the rest of the pattern, but I feel like it's a good thing to mention. So by putting the brothers into more deliberate plots, where their antics aren't just there to make you think about the idle rich people that they're hanging around, they instead Instead, add value judgments based on who is the good guy and who is the bad guy, and sees the brothers facing hardships because of their position, and it makes the times that they show up the rich people feel all the more cathartic. The change in style does make for really interesting distinctions in the experience you'll have, depending on which one that you watch. In the earlier films, you'll see the upper class and their institutions mercilessly mocked directly to their face, and in the later films, you'll see them becoming the villains that the working class heroes have to overcome. Both are really effective ways of using our concepts of class distinction as a method of bringing out comedy. If that also has the knock-on effect of making people think harder about why certain people think they have superiority over others just because they have money, then that's just gravy. But this is where we get to the awkward bit. Because in these later films, there is another repeating element that becomes all too apparent. In A Day at the Races, the brothers hit their plot-required low moment, as Groucho's con is revealed and, along with the young lovers of the movie, they are hiding out in a stable and have a We Are Sad But Things Will Be Better song. And it all seems to be perfectly above board, until it transitions into another song. Harpo is running around playing a little tin recorder, and he plays it around a group of black children who are gambling with dice, and they start acting as if he's some kind of mythical figure because of it. <laughs> The musical number, called All Gods Chill and Got Rhythm, because of course it is, continues in the same way. Harpo comes across groups of black people, plays his recorder, and they declare he's Gabriel and dance and sing about how amazing he is. So this movie stops dead in its tracks to have a scene where a group of black people all sing about how amazing one of the white heroes is. How he is this otherworldly being that they all but worship, and this is very weird, right? All these black people are given such awful, stereotypical portrayals as the simple folk who are so enamoured of Harpo that they will follow him anywhere just because he played a few notes? They are not characters in any way, they're just a novelty act used for giving the white characters an upbeat song to dance to until it is cut short by the police. And oh no, they're doing blackface. This uncomfortable scene is then repeated, somehow even worse, in At the Circus with the song Swingali. My man got a voodoo in that stick! When he voodooed a racky sack, he's eating hypnotizing elf! That man must be Swingali himself! 
and with a group of Native Americans and go west as they watch the obligatory harp solo of the movie in complete awe. So three separate Marx Brothers movies contain scenes where people of colour are made into these ugly stereotypes who sit and watch in awe as Harper plays music. And the racist stuff in the movies goes further than that. There are points all throughout the films where you'll see people of colour being used as a punchline of jokes. Well, what do I owe you? Some ho, some kachita, some nice, some some lasher. What? From Africa to here? A dollar eighty-five? That's an outrage. Who the? Who do you, huh? A goo, a murder, who do you? Birthday picket? Yes, they pick it. In the cotton gin, they stick it. Then they weave it into clothes and fancy rolls. And it is a deeply uncomfortable aspect of watching through these movies. Now, obviously, this is hardly unexpected, given the time period these films were made. You're likely to find it in almost any movie you watch from the period, but that doesn't justify it. This is racism, and it is unacceptable. What kind of lefty would I be if I didn't address systemic racism and the way that it intersects with class issues? A bad one. I will be doing leftism badly. And make no mistake, the racism in these movies is systemic. Because media is part of the system. If these are the only kind of depictions that you see of black people, then it reinforces ideas and stereotypes that work to build the white supremacist society that we live in. For all that I have enjoyed the ways these movies do want to portray the wealthy characters as idle or cruel, and the poor characters as talented and cunning, they do not for a second turn that critical eye onto the greater injustices that the people of colour are unquestionably questionably facing. They are beneath the interest of these movies. They don't reflect at all on the brothers and their issues, they are just considered insignificant except for when they can make Harpo look good, or be a stand-in punchline when there isn't an actual joke. I don't necessarily think that they were trying to be malicious with this, but that might make it kind of worse, because that means they thought these were positive portrayals? It's lazy and unpleasant in a way that the rest of the films aren't. So I initially thought of this video as an April Fool's joke because of the whole Marx surname thing. But when I actually started looking into it, I was surprised by just how well it worked. Because these movies do, whether they intend to or not, actually say some stuff about class divides. They spend so much time mocking and villainizing the rich that it actually reduces their status in the eyes of an audience. They incorporate these ideas into their humor and plot, and it adds a level of depth that might not be apparent on the surface. While it does fall apart when it comes to the depictions of race, and that is absolutely not something that should be overlooked, I do feel like these films are worth seeking out and thinking about. Because they're wonderful, hysterically funny, and they might just make you want to eat the rich. I would like to thank my Patreon patrons for indulging my stopping to think too much about comedy movies from the 30s and 40s, with an extra special thanks to Chris Harper, Dan Brown, William Gray, and Bags. If you'd like to support me, then head to patreon.com slash davidjbradley, or click the link at the end of this video. If you do, you'll get to see all my videos early, get to see blooper videos, and get access to my private Discord server. If not, then you can still help out my channel a great deal by liking, commenting, subscribing, or clicking one of the videos that will pop up at the end. So this is just a little coder to see how many people actually watch through to the end of the video before commenting, because I'm sure that there are plenty of people who think that I'm pronouncing Chico Marx's name wrong, that I should be saying Chico. But the origin of that nickname comes from the fact that he was a notorious womanizer, what they would call a chicken chaser, misogynistic, I know. But from this he became Chico, with a K in it. This got misspelled on a vaudeville bill without the K, and they would keep the spelling, but they would still pronounce it the correct way. You've always said that Chico was the most interesting of the brothers. I've heard you say that. Oh, yes. That. He had a brilliant mind, Chico. If Chico had gone into mathematics or something, he would have been at one someplace in New England. So don't come at me like I don't know my Marx Brothers lore. If you want to show me that you stayed to the end to learn this, then leave a piano keys emoji in your comment.